in our communities. As the cadet program is developed and implemented and to uh, ensure that sustainability, the department will research various method, methods, excuse me, in which to fund the program. There are a number of um, private and nonprofit entities that have helped continue to support our program through financial and logistical support. I'd just uh, like to point out uh, just a couple. United Firefighters of Los Angeles City, they have continued to assist us. The Los Angeles Fire Foundation, the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District, along with uh, East, East Los Angeles College. It is anticipated that the department will maintain these relationships and continue to search uh, for meaningful uh, partnerships in the future um, through a shared commitment in funding the program. There will be a strong emphasis on uh, collaboration in the curriculum development. I've stated a little bit before, uh, but I kind of want to get a little bit more specific. Um, some of the things we've identified as leadership, character building, discipline, academic excellence, and life skills. It's foreseeable through our partnerships and collaboration and curriculum development and talking with our various partners. Uh, some of the things we've identified uh, for the youth in the community are things like physical fitness, uh, cultural diversity, financial literacy. We've talked a little bit about the Teen Cert program emergency uh, medical uh, technician training, as well as uh, fire prevention in their own communities. These are only examples, and they're not all inclusive as the uh, professional development and enhancement of the program continues. Overall, just a summary, the, this uh, action plan, it um, coordinates our department leadership, it coordinates our membership, the actual cadets, uh, the current cadets, the staff members and stakeholders, and the community in uh, basically supporting a common action plan uh, that ensures unity of effort. And um, it is foreseeable um, that the cadet program will truly grow to a, um, a much broader program um, uh, that will ensure effectiveness and efficiency. And again, it will align with the department's uh, strategic goals from 2015 to 2017. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'll uh, turn it over to my colleagues for questions and uh, oral comments. Uh, Councilmember Bonnet. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the report. Uh, I love the cadet program. I was really glad to have uh, the, the, the young folks from cadet uh, from um, uh, Crew 3 in council last year thanking them for the work they did on the fire we had in the Palisades in, uh, about a year ago. Um, just curious, how's uh, gender balance? Uh, how are you doing recruiting young women? The gender balance? Yeah. It's, uh, it's mostly uh, males. It's approximately, right now, we have 90% uh, male and about 10% female at, at this time. The uh, total active cadets is a little bit over 500, which actually, it fluctuates over, over time due to the uh, people um, uh, getting jobs um, and leaving the program or getting hired uh, with uh, different agencies. Uh, do we know how that compares with uh, cadet programs in other jurisdictions? Ours is one of the uh, more robust programs, but we're just looking to, to actually build it out more. Um, I believe LA County, theirs is uh, on par with ours. I mean, as far as um, organizations. Um, I, I meant in terms of gender balance. Oh, gender balance. Yeah. Uh, that I do not know. Okay, I'd like to, if, if there's some department that's doing really good at it, like if somebody's getting 20 or 30%, I'd love to find out how they're doing it and see if there's, there's things we can emulate in terms of recruitment. Absolutely. Uh, of the, uh, the, the June uh, 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 class of uh, recruits, how many were from uh, the cadet program, either ours or somebody else's? There were approximately 11 that were actually from the cadet program. We're actually seeing um, cadets from our program as well as other programs, but specifically from the Los Angeles Fire Department, we had 11, but um, there were cadets and uh, explorers from other agencies also. Uh, any any of the young women uh, part of the recruit class that were part of the um, recruit class from the, from the any of the female cadets go into the recruit class for, no they did not they, they were all male okay um, all right thank you thank you members thank you, thank you mr. chair <coughs> thank you chief for the report um, I've seen the impacts of of introducing our, our young men and women to law enforcement through the LAPD cadet program. One of the mentors through our teen CPAB um, down at the harbor. It's great to hear the progress being made. 
Um, just want to step it up a little bit on, as far as uh, the line of questioning of Mr. Bonin. Can you break down the diversity um, of, of the different, um, what, what you have currently out of the 500 members? Of, I just want to, I want to make sure it mirrors the city of Los Angeles's um, diversity as well. Sure, there, there are, uh, we have 3% Asian, there's 16% Caucasian, 36% Hispanic, 5% African American, and 39% are undisclosed. And can you tell us how this um, report this morning um, impacts the chief's um, efforts um, with the, the fire magnet programs within the LA Unified School District? I recently saw a post on Facebook that he met with Super LA Unified School District Superintendent Cortinas, and that's great to see that he's uh, building those relationships with the school district. Yes, it's a um, very great program that, that we're looking at developing. The uh, magnet program is uh, will be at two schools at uh, Wilson and uh, Banning High Schools. We've been meeting with them, and that should be within the 16-17 uh, uh, school year. Along with that comes a, a lot of resources um, as far as teachers, uh, buses, things of that nature into the magnet program. We're looking at building out approximately uh, two each year uh, after that. There is uh, definitely a lot of uh, interest in the magnet school program. Um, as far as the uh, cadet program, uh, the folks in the magnet program can be a part of the cadet they can, program they, they, also. Okay, good. Yes, so that it's uh, basically an overlay. Um, sometimes um, in the magnet schools, it'll be part of their physical education period. Right. And then uh, on the weekends, a lot of folks, they will go to the cadet program at that point. We're looking at making the cadet program uh, a lot more stable. Uh, right now, uh, they go to the station, someone gets a call, mm -hmm. and they're basically um, there's, there may not be anyone there at that mm -hmm. time. We're looking at developing the program where it's very consistent, uh, similar to uh, what LAPD has, whether it's a Monday or Tuesday evening, where there's someone there all the time at mm -hmm. a specific time with a standard curriculum, okay. which will tie in to the various other programs, Crew 3, which is one, the Cadet Program, Ride Along Program, and the Magnet Program we're speaking of. Um, alt I think... I feel that our ultimate goal here is to, to shape and mold our young men and women as we introduce them to fire safety professional, uh, the, the, um, the fire safety um, um, job opportunities, and hope we don't we don't lose them once, oh, you know, we start hiring. And um, we we were seeing that with the LAPD cadet program, where we spend um, so many t so much time and effort to to see them leave and go to other agencies. Um, and I appreciate the, the report, and I, I, it's great to see the progress being made, um, and great to hear that Banning High School in, in Wilmington is one of the two uh, pilot programs. So, yes, sir. please thank the chief for that. I, I will, sir. The uh, <clears throat> the uh, program is is truly meant for career readiness, right. um, and just really teaching life skills. And um, becoming a firefighter is a, a large part of that. But we do see a lot of people they go off to a lot of different agencies and they want to do other things but it really teaches them at a very basic age just those leadership skills um, how to deal with a lot of other people in the communities um, yeah. how to be able to assist in, in those communities and as far as staffing because you know with with the police department it takes a certain breed to mentor young women and women yes, uh, I understand that this is this is going to be based the operation is going to be based out of, out of fire operations or under your shop, because you know, with a turnaround at the firehouses, it's tough to to dedicate one person or uh, one one firefighter to to the program. Um, and I know you mentioned that's one of your goals as far as the, the wheel out of. We're looking at starting off small. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your uh, question, we're looking at um, basically establishing one uh, post um, with this specific curriculum in each of the um, four bureaus. Uh, geographic bureaus. Okay which will probably be maybe at a regional fire station where it's where they have a classroom in the back, Got so it. it's at the fire station, but yet separate, and they have a class to be able to um, um, conduct the program. Okay. Let us know how we can help in any way for that. Yes. To wheel it out. Thank you. Thank you for your support. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Chief uh, Rideout. I really love I love this, this pilot program. I, I, I love the whole cadet program with uh, LAPD, and uh, I've seen how that has made a positive difference in all the neighborhoods. Um, 
and you've answered a lot of great questions already. Just a, a few more uh, in terms of what might e what might be some of the upcoming funding requests for this slow, you know, um, rollout of, of, of this to the four bureaus. Three, four, some of the things that we have requested, which is in our uh, recruitment budget, which we're requesting for uh, the upcoming fifth fiscal year, mm -hmm. and one of those positions would help um, in the development of the actual program. But in the future, uh, we're going to need um, probably at least one captain and uh, several firefighters to be able to actually run the program. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at anything from budget requests to grants to variable staffing hours, cost sharing, looking at a lot of different uh, methods in which to fund the program. What, what we, um, one of the things we've seen, I've seen, I've been in training for uh, over nine years, <clears throat> one of the things I've seen is that's probably one of the first things to get cut is mm -hmm. training. So we're trying to uh, truly build a sustainable uh, program, uh, whether, you know, whatever type of methods that we can use to garner support to be able to fund the program. Mm -hmm. Right, and just an anecdotal sort of piece on all this is that um, I have um, a clean team that I employ uh, uh, from the LA Conservation Corps youth from the neighborhoods that um, I, I uh, represent mostly. And it is, excuse me, for one, one second. It's, uh -huh. Are we, are we having a problem again? over here or it's disrupting the meeting? The submission of cards have already been closed. I said that earlier. So please take a seat or leave the meeting. Okay, sorry. Please continue. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we uh, ha employ local youth through the Conservation Corps uh, and my clean team. And, it's about evenly split between young men and young women. So there's a real gender balance on that. And where I'm going with this is that about a third of the young um, youth who are in that program um, want to go eventually work for the city in one of the departments. About a third want to become police officers. And about another third want to become firefighters. So uh, I think there's a good, what would you call it, um, a good synthesis there. Of, of young people across Los Angeles from our neighborhoods that are looking for uh, a career with the city. And uh, this, this could be a really great fit. Uh, and I think there are plenty of, um, uh, plenty of agencies uh, to, to draw from to inspire it. And I like how you laid out your outreach piece. And I love the, the focus in terms of the domains that include Cultural, diverse, cultural diversity, life skills education, physical fitness, conflict resolution, uh, all of these just set someone up successfully for life. Uh, so that's a good thing. And, and I, would, I would bet that this is just smart in terms of um, getting more Los Angeles residents into uh, the firefighting profession in L.A. So um, I, I commend you for this program. And, uh, any, and, and like, like Joe said, anything we can do to support Yes, sir. Thank you. I would like to partner with you. Um, if uh, Give me some contact information. I'd love to reach out to some folks in your program to be able to invite them out. So once it's developed, um, maybe we can draw from your program or they can be a part of the cadet program. I, I, I absolutely would love to partner with you. Terrific. So what I'd like to do is invite you to the next lunch that I have for these kids. I say kids, you know, they're 18 to 22. Um, invite you to, to come and sit down with, with them. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thank you very much. All very great questions. And so um, thanks for the information. I'm obviously uh, in love with this program, and it's phenomenal. Uh, anything we can do with, with funding, with support, supplies, uniforms, materials, I would be happy to um, be happy to uh, fund any request as well that we could out of our own discretionary funds. So happy to talk to you offline about that as well. Yes, sir. Thank you I'll, very much. I'll put, put some momentum behind this. Okay. Terrific. Excellent. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. That was for informational purposes only, so I don't believe it requires a vote. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move that item as well. All right. Next item, sir. Item three, LAFD to present verbal report relative to the department's wall time resource kits and wait time statistics pursuant to council action taken February 5th, 2014. Morning, sir. Good morning, Chairman Ingluder, uh, Honorable Council Members. My name is Greg Raynor. I'm an Assistant Chief, and I'm the current Commander of our Department's EMS Division. I was asked to provide you a quick update uh, regarding our hospital wall time issue and the steps that we're taking to address this issue. Um, 
As you know, ambulance patient offload delays have a significant impact on the availability of our ambulances in our community. Um, uh, this issue impacts both public and private ambulance providers. It's an issue that occurs uh, across the state of California and, and obviously the nation also. And um, uh, its root causes are really multifactorial, but they're pretty, for the most part, pretty much hospital-based and community-based. Some of those issues uh, have to deal with uh, that cause these uh, uh, offload delays are decreased hospital inpatient capacity. We don't have enough uh, emergency room beds. Hospitals have closed. Uh, nurse patient staffing ratios in hospitals and the increased incidence of patients being boarded in emergency rooms. Some of that due to the fact that we don't have enough mental health beds locally here within Los Angeles County and also across the state. So uh, these issues really, you know, uh, they're really not the purview or the control really of, of the Los Angeles Fire Department or the City of Los Angeles for the most part, but they do impact public safety and our ability to affect, you know, uh, uh, patient care in emergencies when it becomes extreme and it peaks. Uh, according to the Hospital Association of Southern California, in January alone, they saw increases of 15 to 25 percent in emergency room visits. Uh, we saw a, also an increased incidence of our ambulance transports in January, in part due to the seasonal influenza outbreak. You know, we have more and more people that are visiting emergency rooms. With that, there's a corresponding um, time delay for us to get out of, out of hospitals, obviously. Just uh, uh, to illustrate that, on January 8th, we saw probably our highest ambulance transport day. We actually transported 680 people to the hospital in one 24-hour period. Our average for all of last year was 572. So this is, this is a significant problem for us. A recent national survey involving 200 cities suggested the national average wait time for handing off ambulance patients at hospitals has doubled from 20 minutes to 45 minutes since 2006. The, the problem is not going away. Uh, to address our local issue in, in March of 2013, a collaborative work group organized by the State EMS Authority and the California Hospital Association began to meet to work on addressing this wall time issue. Uh, I know that I've made a previous presentation and updates here uh, with um, the committee, and you're aware of that also. Last fall, this group's efforts were actually published in a document. I know that we've provided that, I think, to um, some of you. And that document, obviously, a lengthy document. It's um, entitled The Toolkit to Reduce Ambulance Patient Offload Delays in the Emergency Department. Uh, the document, uh, very lengthy and, and complex, but what it does is it provides standardized language definitions and metrics and some reporting opportunities for, for documenting these patient offload delays. It identifies best practices for reducing emergency room delays and improving transfer of care times between ambulance crews and hospital staff. And finally, it can assist local jurisdictions in developing these processes and developing some goals so that we can improve performance, not just here locally, but across the state of California. Uh, the document concludes that there's three factors that are keys to helping resolve this. Excuse me, excuse me for one sec. Mm -hmm. Sir, if you're going to keep moving around the room, I'd ask that you stay in one place because you keep placing all your stuff down in various chairs just to make noise, to purposely disrupt this meeting. Uh, if you do it again, because uh, it's clear that it's on purpose, uh, and uh, it's distracting, then we'll ask you to leave. I'm not asking you to speak. I'm going to ask you to leave if you do it again. Thank you, sir. Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, this document concludes that there are three factors that are key to helping resolve ambulance patient offload delays. Optimizing emergency room intake processes is for patients. You know, doing things smarter and more efficiently in the emergency rooms. Number two, successful and continuous quality improvement measures at the hospitals and also with our, our local EMS agencies. We have 33 of them in the, in the state of California. And finally, hospital and local EMS agency collaboration, working on this, identifying it, thinking about it, measure, measuring it, analyzing it, and moving to try and make the problem better and improve our, our performance. Uh, locally here for the department in, in the city of Los Angeles, in the last five years, our ambulance transports have gone up 12%. You know that uh, budgetarily, obviously, you know, you're well aware of uh, the resources that we have available and the cuts that we've taken. Um, you know, if we were driving very fast in our sports car previously, we're kind of redlined right now when it comes to providing ambulance transport capabilities for our public. So it's very important that if we have these issues, like ambulance wall time, that if we can make it as efficient as possible, it obviously helps, you know, protect our communities. Just yesterday, we transported uh, 626 people to the hospital in a 24-hour period. In a 24-hour period? Wow. Yes, sir. Wow. And that's every day. That's that's not Numbers that's not, um, not unique. That's not extraordinary. And my point is, is that um, for us, we're the largest fire-based ambulance provider in the state of California. Mm -hmm. This is big business. Yeah. Okay. Uh, today, we're staffing actually 134 ambulances in the city of Los Angeles right now. 
probably the, the largest private ambulance provider uh, in the state, you know, staffs about 72 ambulances locally. So this is, this is very significant and it obviously does impact patient care. Um, what I wanted to do before I left today with you, I wanted to update you on efforts that we're doing here locally uh, within the city and also within the department to address this issue. It's very important. We're, we're continuing to meet with LA County EMS agency officials and Hospital uh, Association of Southern California officials to continue to address this issue at the hospital level by using the best practices that were identified in the toolkit document. Uh, it serves as really a guiding foundational document identifying those best practices that will help us here locally. Secondly, we're using new AVL software at our dispatch center to better track the location and status of not only our ambulances, but of all fire resources. We've transmitted a policy to all LAFD members regarding hospital overcrowding, ambulance availability, and hospital wait time. We're dispatching field supervisors to hospitals to engage hospital leadership when bed delays occur. Uh, for example, we have a standing policy that if there's an ambulance in a hospital for more than an hour, the supervisor is sent to that hospital to deal with the hospital leadership and see if we can get the, hospital, the ambulance available. Or if we have three ambulances in an emergency room for 15 minutes or more, uh, we do the same thing. Uh, we've implemented an EMS surge plan. We've strategically located uh, ready reserve ambulances uh, across the city so that if we have these peak periods of transport volume, we can actually move staffing uh, amongst our resources and staff additional ambulances at a moment's notice. And that's being um, handled by our, our dispatch center, and they're the key for that. We're working with our EPCR vendor, Sancio. You know, we uh, actually record patient care data now electronically. And what we're doing is we're going to deploy new software programming that will better document the time um, that it takes to actually transfer that care between our staff and the hospital staff. Currently today, the reports that are used uh, by our local EMS agency, the County of Los Angeles, don't include a time for when the care actually goes from our gurney to the hospital gurney. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to deploy that here within our own department and start collecting that data. Uh, I anticipate in the next three to four weeks that software will be in place and we'll be able to provide that to our local EMS agency to help them uh, move along with the process. And finally, Fire Chief Trazos and our medical director, Dr. Exine, are directing the completion of some necessary staff work on several new very innovative projects that would help to address this issue of hospital wait time. These projects are being prepared for presentation to our fire commission, and I do appreciate your support on, on the motion um, yesterday, Councilman Englander. Finally, uh, on behalf of our, our patients and our firefighters and paramedics who come to their aid every day, I'd like to thank you all for your continued support on this important community issue. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence today of Jaime Garcia, uh, a vice president of the Hospital Association of Southern California in the audience. Jaime. And then uh, also John Histerich, a good friend of yours, um, who was uh, sworn in yesterday as our latest commissioner for the LA County EMS Commission. Uh, they're going to be great partners in moving ahead with this, this problem. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, this is a, um, a big problem. And uh, it's a big problem not just here in Los Angeles, um, but nationally. And as the um, member of the Public Safety Steering Committee for the National League of Cities as well, uh, we talk often about what we can do in looking at best practices, what they're doing, for example, in Miami and also in Dallas and um, Mesa, Arizona with nurse practitioners and, and the like, and the direction that we're going. Um, the fact that we are the first department to deploy Firestat and, uh, and the tool that it's become in spreading out even having four bureaus now and having a bureau chief. Um, that is able to work with collaboratively not only the hospital association, I want to recognize uh, the efforts that they're trying to make as well because healthcare uh, in, in this country is on life support and particularly in this region where we've closed more hospitals in the last 25 years than we've opened. Um, every hospital room right now is running ER at 25 or 95% capacity 24 hours a day. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a real problem uh, here and uh, the strategy uh, that has been developed in moving forward uh, over the last several months in the working group and particularly with Dr. Eckstein and yourself and the chief is extraordinary because we're, we're, we're for the first time able to transparently and accurately measure the data uh, and then collaborate on strategies and, and, and dive down and do a deeper dive into how can we start fixing some of these issues? Uh, looking at a lot of the frequent flyers and the chronic callers, uh, most people don't realize uh, and would be shocked to learn. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and welcome uh, Councilwoman Nuri Martinez as well to the committee. Good morning. 
uh, would be shocked to learn that we have uh, so many residents here in Los Angeles that use our emergency system uh, for basic, and, and I'd call it basic life support. It's not even life support, uh, where they, they call over 100, 200, 300 times in a calendar year to be transported. Um, and uh, many, many, many of them without any serious illness whatsoever. Um, tying up valuable resources and putting other lives in jeopardy. Uh, the fact that we've got a plan now to address that as well. Uh, and so many other things that are unfolding. Obviously, we can't do it overnight, uh, and nor should we. But those things are being implemented uh, incrementally. The other thing I'd like to recognize is the dispatch system which and, and our dispatchers, which uh, have come such a long way in such a short amount of time. Uh, the group that collectively got together, and I'd ask all my colleagues, if you haven't yet gone to the Emergency Operations Center and met with the dispatchers and actually gone through to see the new protocols that we've put in place, it's remarkable. Uh, it really is. And then you can see they also put together a live demo to show the old system versus what we're doing now. And that's only been operational for about a month. It remains incredibly fluid. Uh, so there's constant updates and dialogue with our dispatchers where they're finding problems. Now, what I saw just out of that alone, and talk about um, a dramatic change in response time and what that's going to do to improve uh, actually getting a unit on location, on scene, and dispatching uh, the resources is a priority dispatch system, is identifying exactly what we need, not rolling out everything, um, and sending out the resources based on that call. But more importantly, um, or just as important. The, the interesting thing is a lot of folks um, uh, are customers that call at those frantic times. They are so frustrated and they often and for years would actually yell at the dispatchers, why do you keep asking me this information? Why Just send somebody. Send somebody. Um, we saw it on uh, 60 Minutes did a thing on their, uh, the other day on uh, the cell phone triangulation issues that we've done a really great job of technologically to improve our systems here. But getting somebody on scene right away, not having to ask questions that don't make any sense whatsoever, um, it's a huge difference. And so I would ask that, that everybody on this committee, uh, as soon as possible, make an appointment if you haven't done so already, go down there. They'd be delighted to show you it's a dramatic difference. And so all of these things combined um, are really changing the path and the culture of the department. And uh, I couldn't be more proud. Again, we're doing more with less. We've got to get the hiring back up. We've got to make sure you get the resources and restore this department that's been decimated. Um, but these very finite technical adjustments on a regular and daily basis uh, is... Um, is revolutionary, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, I want to send my best to the chief for his leadership. And, uh, and also, I think, recognize uh, the mayor and their team and Eileen Decker and the fire commission because they've been working tirelessly to ensure that this is done. Um, I'd also like to um, uh, give a little bit of uh, a twist to some of the reports that have come out, um, particularly the last one in the LA Times on uh, fire stat and saying, well, response times have actually gone up a little, and they reported that. And I asked the reporter on this um, because I really couldn't understand how they came to that conclusion. Their first report said that our data was incorrect, it wasn't uh, accurate, it wasn't verified. That was all true. And we thank them for all the work that they did in working with the city and, and analyzing and doing a deep dive into the data. So we fixed that. We brought in and established the IDA, which is the Information Data Analysis Team, um, led by uh, 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 Chief Butler and Alan Scobin and so many other great leaders that came together to work on that effort, yourself and so many others. We figured out and made it triple verifiable um, and to ensure that it was transparent, it was accurate. We found all the inaccuracies and discrepancies and we fixed and corrected those. And then we put out the first new baseline of data and response time. And the and reports come out from the media saying, well, compared to the old data, your response times have gone up. Well, you can't have it both ways. If the story is that the response time previously was inaccurate 
and the data was wrong, and now we have a new baseline of accurate data, how can you say they've gone up? We have a new baseline. You can't compare it if your own story says that it was inaccurate. So I had a real issue with that because the general public, that's our way to get the message out that we're doing the right thing. We've put a lot of boots on the ground, brought in a lot of experts, um, and we're going in the right direction. We also have these challenges that are beyond our control, such as wall time. And with that, we're moving forward on very st strategic approaches, uh, which are already yielding tremendous results, and we have a lot more to do, and those are being implemented. So I wanted to get all that out there, and I really appreciate it, and, uh, and thank you for that as well. I know there's a lot more to talk about, and particularly as we roll out the motion that was introduced um, uh, for nurse practitioners, and, uh, but that's not for this agenda. And uh, turn it over to any of my colleagues for questions, comments, concerns, or compliments. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, having been queued up, I'll start with the compliment. I want to compliment uh, Mr. Englander for the uh, motion you put in the other day about nurse practitioners, which I think is uh, one way of sort of helping with, with, a, with a bit of this problem. I just had a, uh, a, a couple questions. Uh, at what point do, does the responsibility for the, the patient transfer from LAFD to the hospital? You know, uh, Councilman Bonin, um, it's a very good question, and it's a legal question. You know, we do have EMTALA requirements. And what EMTALA says is that legally, when our resources, our ambulances get on the property of a hospital, it, the patient actually becomes the responsibility of the hospital. Um, however, it also states that there has to be an effective transfer of care between the ambulance crew and that hospital staff. That's the issue, that's the sticking point, is if there's not enough beds, there's not enough capacity in the emergency rooms, and the staff is inundated with critically ill and injured patients, we can't complete that effective transfer of care. So we maintain, we've always maintained as our policy, our department policy, we maintain the care of our patient until that effective safe transfer of care can occur. Right. It's, it's good for our patients, it's, it's good for the hospital, and we're partners here. We understand that. However, there is an issue with the efficiency of the emergency room in the hospitals and the ability to move patients out of the emergency room upstairs to maybe beds in the hospital or, quite frankly, to move patients out of an emergency room to discharge them to other treating or specialty centers like mental health facilities and others. So all of those things actually have an impact on our ability to yeah. transfer that care. So the department has a policy to transport anybody who calls 911 unless it's sort of a minor extremity injury or something, right? Our policy is that all patients are evaluated that we, that we come in contact with. We document our treatment and care, and we offer transportation to our patients uh, if they'd like to go to the hospital. Many times, they'll decline. In some instances, they'll refuse to go, even though it's in their best interest, and we'll do it against medical advice with base station, contact the hospital. Do you have any, this is a bit of a subjective question, but do you have any sense of um, uh, how many folks, sort of percentage-wise, really don't need 911 or an ambulance, but they, 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 they are under the impression that this gets them to cut the line at the emergency room? You know, uh, Councilman, it's, you know, that, you're right. It's a very subjective question. I've been a paramedic for 35 years. I've seen thousands of patients. And the people that we have, our, our folks, our great paramedics and firefighters in the field right now are dealing with this every day. If you asked each one of them, they would give you a different answer. Uh, what I can tell you is factually, statistically, yesterday we went on 1,088 EMS incidents. Of those EMS incidents, we transported 626 people to the hospital. So not everybody's going to the hospital if there was a patient at every one of those EMS incidents. And uh, you know, that's what I can tell you statistically and, and factually. However, you can imagine, you know, personally speaking, you know, your emergency today at your home while you're here uh, at council, um, you know, what may be a, an emergency for your family member may not be subjectively possibly an emergency for someone else or, or a physician or a nurse or a paramedic or firefighter. Is, is there a public perception that if you're, if you, if you're transported to the hospital by ambulance as opposed to by your spouse or, or walking in that you get to cut the line at the ER? I would think that, yes, that would be an accurate statement. Uh, if you've been into a, a waiting room out of an emergency room any time recently, you'll know that the emergency rooms, waiting rooms, are inundated. Yep. You can go to County USC today, and it's packed. The, the emergency room has over 100 beds to treat people in the back, you know, but we have these long wait times in, in waiting rooms. So yes, if people call 911 and they're transported by ambulance, whether it be our ambulance or another pre-hospital provider's ambulance, they don't sit in the waiting room. They're going into the hallway at least at the very minimum. Many times, and what we're trying to do is engage our hospital partners in, in realizing that just 
because they arrive on our gurney, that that shouldn't predicate the level, level necessarily the level of importance of that patient. They arrive on our gurney. If the patient can be actually triaged and placed in a waiting room chair, that makes our ambulances available right. and doesn't place us on the wall. So we're actually engaging that, that, that piece and that question and that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have one quick question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief. About what percentage of the calls that you respond to are of indigent individuals? Do you have an approximate number? Uh, I don't. Right off the top of my head, we, we could provide that for you. I think, you know, obviously your definition of indigent, you know, might be slightly subjective. You know, at this point, you know, uh, for our ambulance transports, you know, we do attempt to get reimbursement. Uh, you know, many of our folks don't have insurance or they're entering. I guess know. essentially homeless. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a significant issue, especially I'm um, here locally, you know, in the Civic Center. You're aware of that. Um, you know, we do transport folks that don't, don't have a home. And sometimes they actually utilize us for their primary care. Okay, so. mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thanks for the update. Okay. If we can go ahead and go on to um, item four. I just got a couple quick questions on item four. Item four, Board of Fire Commissioners report and CA report, which is submitted to you. To, relative to a proposed agreement with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan for the provision of targeted destination ambulance services. I'm just going to just, if I could, just jump right to the questions because the program and the report explained already exactly what it does. And so I appreciate that. Um, in fact, it's, it's just great where we can actually partner with hospitals, have that relationship, particularly knowing full well that we're only transporting to them when they're insured by them. So. It's, 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 uh, I wish we had that with, with other institutions that had that ability as well. So, but with that, I just also wanted to ensure that um, it's a closed loop system and it doesn't have any um, ramifications on the other parts of, in, of, of our system. So one is um, uh, a wall time guarantee as we just got off the wall time conversation. So if in fact we do transport directly a Kaiser patient to a Kaiser hospital on their request, do we have a guarantee from Kaiser that they're going to take that patient in any, you know, with a specific time? That's my first question. Um, the second question is, is there a maximum distance? Because, for example, in my district, if they pick up a Kaiser patient in Porter Ranch, they're driving all the way to Woodland Hills or Panorama City, and um, that may not just be feasible. And so, you know, you're passing three hospitals in that case and taking that unit out of service. Um, just not sure if that, that really works citywide. Um, also wanted to know if there's a right to refusal. In other words, if the department can say, well, ma'am, sir, we just don't have the opportunity right now to go all the way to Woodland Hills or, or, or Panorama City or wherever that might be based on our car, lo our car, car load or whatever. I, you know, they, they just have that decision to make and, and we don't lose that opportunity. Um, and then lastly, my, my question is, um, is this fully cost recovery in terms of what we charge our flat base rate for um, BLS or ALS transport versus the reimbursement. So, um, and then also, if it's not, if it is, that's great. So these are just quick answers um, to ensure. And if we don't have all the answers for that now, that's, that's fine too. I'd like to know um, if we have those answers to all those questions or not. Uh, if I may, Councilman. Uh, Sal Martinez, the uh, Los Angeles Fire Department. I'd like to take your last one, and I'd ask uh, uh, Chief Raynard to come up and address those operational questions. Okay. But just to... Uh, and we can uh, keep it brief. Sure. But uh, I just really want to make quickly, sure those the, um, pass an answer. Uh, yeah. The fee that we're charging for the, uh, from the fee we get from uh, Kaiser is totally separate from our ALS, BLS fees. Those are paid and separate. This is on top of... No, I under, not, okay, let me readjust the question. <clears throat> so, as an example, say it was... $200, and I know that's not the rate, but without getting into the direct rates, mm -hmm. um, uh, hypothetically, if we charged the average person, any, anybody, $200, oftentimes different insurance companies pay different amounts back, mm -hmm. which creates a gap or a differential. So um, how much we're billing Kaiser, our full rate, for, uh, not on top of this contract, but we also bill them. This is it, right. over and above. Right. Or, are they paying back the full rate? 
Uh, for those Kaiser patients, we get the bulk of our reimbursements that we do trans. Uh, we, we do transport. Yes, we do. They get. They pay full 100 percent of what we bill. Uh, they pay the bulk, the bulk of it. I'd have to go back and check the exact rates they pay. But those that are not paid, we bill them separately, and they pay that differential. The patient would be obligated to pay the differential from what Kaiser <clears throat> paid to what the actual do we, was. Do we track on those specific Kaiser patients? Yes, we do. We track on all of them. There, do we track their differential recovery? In other words, are we getting 100% back on those particular patients that we bill the differential for? Uh, the, we, we get the bulk of it. I, I don't have those exact figures because we look at it in, a, in the totality. But I want to break those out and look at those separately. Certainly. Okay. Uh, right to refusal? Uh, Councilman Englander, yes, absolutely, they have a right to refusal. In fact, in our department policy, our department of Bolton, the last sentence in bold states that our members have the the unadulterated right to refuse to take a person to Kaiser based on the current condition of the patient and their medical needs and um, based on the current geographic demand and, and volume of activity that's in that area. So we retain that right to, to do that. Okay, great. And then the maximum distance? There is no maximum distance. Currently, we're transporting to seven Kaiser hospitals. I can tell you from um, my research that Kaiser actually is uh, one of our best uh, hospital groups to deal with with the lowest amount of wall time. Um, so there's a requirement for this program to transport more than three miles for them to come into this program, but there isn't a maximum. And, you know, quite frankly, based on, you know, uh, any other patient, you know, sometimes we do go five, six, eight miles to, to hospitals to get patients to where they need to go based on their specialty and their needs. And is there a wall time guarantee with Kaiser under this? Under this agreement, no, sir. There is no wall time uh, agreement under this this agreement. The agreement for you, and I think, to understand is that this is not a new agreement. We've actually had an agreement um, similar to this in place for uh, nearly yeah, no, 15 years, and uh, it's it's been very very beneficial for us. As this comes to council, I'd like to see um, if there's possible for an amendment to work with Kaiser and see if there's a wall time guarantee not to exceed a specific time, or at least start tracking that under Firestat as well to specifically the Kaiser, since the, it's unique. This is a great partnership. I'm not. Um, trying to explore this for any other purpose than um, in the department's best interest and the, in the interest of the residents of the city of Los Angeles. So if we can look into that um, and just let me know prior for, to this coming to council on what the outcome of that might be. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go ahead and turn the meeting over to Joe Buscaino. I've got to um, run out to another meeting, um, and so he's going to take it over. But in the meantime, uh, turn it over to Councilwoman uh, Nuri Martinez for a question. I just have a quick question. Uh, do you approximately know how many Kaiser transports yep. you do on a daily basis? I don't have the daily uh, averages, ma'am, but what I can tell you is that... Um, uh, if we look at it quarterly and monthly, I do have those statistics. For example, in uh, uh, September of 2014, the last date I have, the total patients we transported were 18,290. Uh, of all of those total patients, uh, we transported uh, 1,600 Kaiser members. So 1,644 of 18,290. It's a small fraction. And of those 1,644, 16, all of them wouldn't fit into this category because, quite frankly, some of them would be closer to a Kaiser facility than three miles. Right. So it's a very small statistical fraction of folks. And the reason why the program is so important is what it does is it provides um, you know, people that do have Kaiser insurance at a Kaiser facility so they don't have to undergo additional testing and the additional cost of that. And then, quite frankly, people that are really sick and injured, they don't have that repatriation time. We get a person to where they need to be the first time instead of having a, a secondary transports and, and lengthening out this, this transport time, which obviously has an impact on ambulance availability. So it's getting the patient to the right location the first time. And Kaiser has been a great partner and actually provided us, you know, some additional incentive to try and do that for them also because it's CSM money also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Any other questions, colleagues? Okay, hearing none, we'll um, approve this item. And I believe it was the direction of the chair to get a report back on the wall time guarantee from Kaiser. Right. Okay. We'll approve that without objection. Send that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, I believe item seven next. Item seven, Board of Police Commissioners report and CO report relative to the Smart Policing Institutionalizing Operation Laser Supplemental Grant Award in the amount of $400,000 
for use by the LAPD to reduce violent and property crime in specific locations and among specific chronic offenders. The question that the chair had was, how is this going to have an impact on the existing uh, labor la laser program moving forward? Uh, will, any, will any divisions be, lo be lost? Um, no, it doesn't appear that there's going to be any change to the existing. This is merely expanding into other areas. Very good. And how are, how are the, um, the areas identified as far as do they have to qualify for a certain amount of violent crime in the specific respective areas throughout the city? Tyler, CA, Tyler Munhall, CAO. I believe that it was based on crime stats. Got it. I would have to. That makes sense. To get more detail, I'd have to talk to the department. Okay. Colleagues, question on item seven. Yeah. Okay. Hearing none, um, we'll approve this item without objection. Thank you so much. And our final item, I believe, is item 11. Your last item is item 11. See a report relative to a grant award in the amount of $125,000 from the Verizon Wireless Foundation for use by the city attorney to enhance the victim assistance program. Great partnership, Steve's here with uh, Verizon Wireless Foundation. Thank you very much. Can you just give us a um, brief background um, and some history of, of the program? Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Derek Tanel, the director of the uh, City Attorney's Victim Assistance Program. The Victim Assistance Program provides services to help victims of uh, in crime throughout Los Angeles. We are in our 35th year of operation. There are a total of 10 offices, eight of which are placed directly in LAPD stations. Each year, the program assists more than 7,000 new victims of crime, including domestic violence, sexual assault, child and elder abuse, robbery assault, hate crimes, and driving under the influence of uh, vehicle crimes and homicide victims. And it seems like this is a, a, a partnership with Peace Over Violence, right? This is, ultimately, that would be the nonprofit that would benefit from the, these dollars coming in. Peace Over Violence is acting as a pass-through, so the money would go from Verizon to Peace Over Violence to the city of Los Angeles. Very good. As, and that would be that's the identified nonprofit. Yes. Very good. Um, I believe um, the chair wanted just to get a report back in, in a year to explain the progress of, of the program. and. Um, if, if we can, that will be the direction. Just give us an, an update a year from now and give us a report to see how the, how the program's working. Absolutely. Okay. Questions, colleagues? Very good. Okay, hearing no. Hearing none, we'll um, approve this item without objection. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's cleared our agenda for the day. Yes. Okay, thanks, John. Any um, all comments, public comment, open and close, and we're good. Okay, we'll see you down at council. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the meeting went a lot smoother after Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs>